Sup, chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. I know some of you are getting ready for the Thanksgiving holiday. I'm sure everyone is excited to sit down with Uncle Fred and Aunt Sally over a nice tofurkey dinner where someone will inevitably ruin the night by arguing about politics or religion, which makes you especially thankful that this tradition only has to happen once per year. So, I thought I'd share just a little bit of optimism before the holidays. And even for those who don't celebrate Thanksgiving, you are still going to have to face the dreaded Black Friday sales, which unlike Thanksgiving, is now a universally celebrated launch date for unrestrained capitalism up until Christmas, where people will spend money that they don't have to buy gifts that people don't want. Anyways, one of my viewers on my last video made this comment, quote, the change of nocturnal penile tumescence during Dutastra administration, is it bad news? Unquote. Good question, Jim. I hadn't heard about this article before, so I went ahead and looked it up on PubMed. You can see that it was published less than two weeks ago. And you can also see that there is no abstract or summary of the article available. It's not surprisingly, the article was behind a paywall. Fortunately, I have my Witcher skills, so I use the Axie sign on the publishers to make it available to me for free, and by extent, that also makes it free for you. So, you're welcome, my fellow hair loss Witchers. But in all seriousness, Chooms, a lot of people have asked me how I do research, and I do want to do a video on how you can refine your skills as a hair loss witcher when conducting scientific research, because I think the best defense against misinformation is knowledge. Therefore, it would be especially useful to my viewers to know how you can get copies of articles behind paywalls and how to best organize and analyze that research. But that's another video for another day. For now, let's take a look at this article. The authors first note that the incidence of erectile dysfunction from dutasteride used for benign prostate static hyperplasia, or BPH, ranged from 1.7% to 11% in different studies, but these studies all just used patient interviews or questionnaires to assess whether or not ED was present. And that's also true of studies of both finasteride and dutasteride, even in young men being treated for hair loss. The incidence of erectile dysfunction is always assessed by subjective symptoms or by questionnaires, but the question is, how reliable is the subjective estimate of erectile dysfunction in these studies? Fortunately, there is a unique device that can give us an objective measurement. It's called an erectometer, or as I like to call it, an erectometer. It can measure the change in the circumference of the penis during sleep. It basically can measure the quality of morning wood, and it is an objective measurement of the erectile function of the penis. I won't show a picture of the device because I don't want this video to get taken down, but the idea of this new study was to try to correlate the subjective complaints of erectile dysfunction in dutasteride users with the objective measurements of erectile function using the erectometer. This was a prospective study. Men with BPH were enrolled and treated with dutasteride at a dose of 0.5 milligrams per day, which is the standard dose. They filled out standard questionnaires on sexual function and underwent testing for erectile function during sleep using the erectometer over a period of three nights before starting treatment. The questionnaires and the erectile function testing was then repeated after taking dutasteride for three months and then for six months. The two questionnaires used were the Sexual Health Inventory of Men, or SHIM, and the Erection Hardness Score, or EHS. Yes. The SHIM questionnaire is basically a series of five questions on sexual function during intercourse. The EHS is an overall subjective rating of the hardness of erections on a scale of one to four. There were 20 men enrolled in the study, and these were all old men with an average age of 71.4 years. So, as expected, dutasteride decreased the size of the prostate and improved urinary function. Both dutasteride and finasteride are excellent drugs for treating BPH after all, and that has been demonstrated in many studies. So that's no surprise since they're both drugs that are approved by the FDA for treating BPH. So, the results are contained in this figure, but let me just go ahead and summarize what this shows. Basically, while there was some decrease in sexual function as assessed by the questionnaires, there was no significant decrease in nocturnal erectile function. Not only that, there is no correlation between the subjective erectile hardness score and the actual measured nocturnal erectile function. So, the authors conclude that the reduction in actual nocturnal erectile function was minimal and not statistically significant after six months of dutasteride use. More importantly, there was no correlation between the subjective and objective findings, meaning relying just on questionnaires really is insufficient for evaluating erectile dysfunction. The implication here is that questionnaires overestimate the amount of erectile dysfunction present in clinical studies done with finasteride and dutasteride. The reason for this is most likely a nocebo effect. All these men knew they were taking dutasteride. There is no placebo used in the study. So therefore, these men would very likely be subject to a nocebo effect due to the fact that they 
all knew that dutasteride could cause erectile dysfunction. However, the objective measurement of erectile function at night did not correlate with their subjective estimate of erectile function. We know that the nocebo effect is a very real and very powerful phenomenon, and that's because of a classic article published back in 2007. The article showed that the mere knowledge that finasteride can cause sexual side effects resulted in a much higher incidence of sexual side effects in men who were so informed. And these men were just told about the real side effects of finasteride, not the fake side effects you hear about online like post-finasteride syndrome, which wasn't even around back then since it wasn't invented on the internet yet. But you could just imagine how much worse the nocebo effect would be if the subjects were told about the fake side effects of finasteride and not just the real side effects. Fortunately, the nocebo effect can be overcome. I did a whole video on the nocebo effect that I'll link below that outlines mental strategies that you can use to overcome the misinformation about 5-air inhibitors online. But this current study is completely consistent with the nocebo effect magnifying symptoms of erectile dysfunction beyond the actual objective findings. Now, this is a small study and it is limited to older men with BPH and not hair loss, and older men have a higher risk of erectile dysfunction than younger men to begin with, obviously. But I think I think the message of this study still applies to younger men with hair loss. Dutasteride had minimal effects on nocturnal erections even in these older men, so this is especially reassuring data for younger men who might be afraid to start finasteride or dutasteride. The incidence of erectile dysfunction is low for these drugs, even in older men, and oftentimes men have a nocebo effect when starting these drugs because of all the rampant fear-mongering and misinformation they've been exposed to online, especially since most people are addicted to their smartphones and spend the vast majority of their lives on the internet where scammers and conspiracy theorists will prey on their insecurities and ignorance. However, usually these nocebo side effects will disappear as you continue taking the drug, and even the real side effects of finasteride and dutasteride will often go away if you you keep taking the drug. So even if you do get side effects on 5-air inhibitors, whether they be real or imagined side effects, push through. There are some people who just flat out can't use 5-air inhibitors under any circumstances, but you're not going to know that for sure unless you give the side effects some time to resolve on their own. So you should give it at least a few months. And even after that, you're still not out of options so you can, since you can try things like titrating the dose down or using topical finasteride. The truth is, there are very, very few people who can't use 5-air inhibitors. It's just that some people take a little bit more time to get used to them, and that's fine. I have plenty of videos on this channel about dose titration and I'll link one of them below. So, a lot of finasteride haters keep telling us that as more data comes along, it will prove that 5-air inhibitors are as dangerous as they claim they are, but on the contrary, the new data is only reinforcing what has already been proven about these drugs, which is that they are safe and effective treatments for stopping the slaphead curse forever. So, this Thanksgiving, we hair loss witchers can be especially thankful that all the attempts to gaslight or even flat out ban these wonderful drugs have all failed, and they will continue to do so because science is on our side. Thank you for watching. God bless.